<laughs> In a top 10 list of most unlikely things to happen, me being disappointed in Tears of the Kingdom would be at number one. Yet, here we are. I'm disappointed. The Legend of Zelda is one of my favorite game series out there. I've been playing these games for the better part of 30 years. So this isn't some knee-jerk reaction. I've been around through all the series' ups and downs, and yeah, I haven't played every Zelda game release, but my roots with the franchise go deep. I remember meeting some of my best friends in school just because we'd be sitting in class drawing Link or the Master Sword or something. So when I say that a Zelda game disappointed me, I mean it sincerely. I'm not a fanboy. I don't eat up everything Zelda related that Nintendo pushes out and expects you to accept just because it's Zelda. The series has changed so much over the years and I'm all for it, but this just ain't it. I think the biggest problem with my Tears of the Kingdom experience is that I played Breath of the Wild. Shame on me, I know. You would think to get more context and a better experience with a sequel, you would be encouraged to play the game that precedes it. But I don't know if that's the case with Tears of the Kingdom. What we got was Breath of the Wild, again. Minus a lot of the things that made that game so great. It felt more like a reboot than a sequel. And now all I see online is how Tears fixed all of Breath of the Wild's problems, which isn't true. It didn't fix problems, it replaced them with new problems. Playing the game feels so strange, and I don't mean the new abilities. Those were so fun and creative that it made me feel genuinely like a kid again. But even those came with a whole host of new problems. The most glaring issues for me is the story and the way it was told, the new locations they added, and what was done with them. And the gripes I had with Breath of the Wild's gameplay were simultaneously addressed in some ways, but then left in Tears of the Kingdom. So hey everyone, I'm here to alienate every gamer imaginable with my awkward takes. Be sure to dislike this video and have the day you deserve. But for anyone still interested in hearing what I have to say about the game, let's talk about The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Something that happened to me while I was playing Tears of the Kingdom was a common occurrence I noticed a lot of other people experienced themselves. The first 10 hours or so of this game was just overwhelming. For my first four hours of gameplay, I spent it on the Great Sky Island, taking my time, just as I did in Breath of the Wild's Great Plateau, learning the quirks of Ultra Hand, seeing how Ascend can be applied, experimenting with the fuse mechanic, and generally just taking in the vistas of the sky above Hyrule. It didn't matter which direction I was looking, there was always a cluster of islands off in the distance, and I would let my mind wander about what could possibly be out there. But this overwhelming feeling was then compounded when you took your your first descent into the depths. Nintendo did not reveal this part of the game at all. And after finishing the game, I can see why, but we'll get into that later. After this initial overload, this creeping feeling started to emerge. This feeling of deja vu. No matter where I went or what I did, I couldn't help but feel that I've done all this before. Shrines, Koroks, collecting the same armor sets we already had, fighting the same monsters, breaking the same weapons, going to the same towns, and largely the same sites. I need to preface this before going going into my overall opinions because it illustrates why this feels so much like a reboot. I really wasn't all that concerned about them reusing the same Hyrule. I figured that they would pack enough into the sky and maybe change Hyrule's makeup a little bit to make it really feel like a fresh experience regardless if you played Breath of the Wild or not. Unfortunately, that's not what happened. And this is what I mean by reboot. It feels like Nintendo wants you to forget about Breath of the Wild completely. The characters in the game largely don't mention anything that previously happened in any capacity. Nothing is said in game to explain what happened in the Sheikah technology, and there's an effort to rebuild Hyrule? I don't see it. Freaking Hudson with the help of Link built a whole town in two freaking days, but it's been like seven years mm. and the area outside Hyrule Castle is still rubble. We don't see enough change in Hyrule at all. It's largely the same. There are more people out and about in the world, sure, but no one is working to actually revitalize the land. When Mubs told us about pirates at Loreland Village, I was freaking ecstatic. 
pirates in a Zelda game again. Oh man, my I, my mind was in overdrive. All I can think of was, oh man, who's this Who's this pirate captain? What are they going to be like? What, who are we going to be fighting? Bokoblins. They're Bokoblins. The only pirate thing about them is some non-functioning ship. You are not a pirate. Wouldn't it be a freaking shame if they had a ship with the health bar you had to blow up? Or an interesting <laughs> pirate antagonist that we had to thwart in some fun way? Nope. Bokoblins. Nintendo reusing the Hyrule from Breath of the Wild was a topic of hot debate before the launch of Tears of the Kingdom. Again, I really didn't think it was that big of a deal, but quickly I realized that I was kind of wrong. You see, one of the best parts of exploring Hyrule for the first time was that everything you discovered was brand new. It's that newness that drove me to investigate every nook and cranny of the world. I never got tired of exploring the world in the game about exploring the world. So many distinct landmarks and points of interest that would motivate you to set out on the journey to get there just for the sake of seeing something new and the possibilities of what you will find along the way. New adventures, new areas, new everything. And yes, somewhat that is the same in Tears of the Kingdom until it isn't. But let's divide each section of the world of Tears of the Kingdom the way that it's broken down in game by three areas, the sky, the land, and the depths to see what worked for me and what didn't work all that well. We begin the game proper in the most advertised new location, the sky. Nothing could have prepared me for what being that high above Hyrule would feel like. I will say, the Great Sky Island is the one new area in the entire game that encapsulates the potential that was missed when it comes to the sky. The Great Sky Island has so many biomes, level of verticality, and figuring out how you're supposed to traverse this alien terrain. Most of the genius of the Great Sky Island is that your movement is largely restricted. Gliding between islands is impossible. You don't have your paraglider, so falling feels treacherous. It's that lack of your safety net that adds to approaching the terrain differently and engaging. You could build some devices, but their range is limited, and you're still learning how to use Ultra Hand, so the chances of the average player making a hover bike like device to make quick work of traversal your first few hours are pretty slim. Actually, the Great Sky Island is so good, I kind of wish they didn't introduce you to it until later in the game if this was going to be the only sky island of this caliber. It really is the best area in the sky for me bar none. It is strange that they would put their best foot forward and then not have another great sky island moment in the game. Sure the wind temple and water temples were very interesting in their own right but they felt more like a spectacle more than anything. They are extremely fun for what they were. I think a big problem with the Sky Islands, aside from the sheer lack in quantity, was the lack of NPCs in the sky. Sure, you'll get a steward construct here and there that will give you little tidbits of lore, but we never see people in Hyrule ascend to the sky, which is strange because you have citizens of Hyrule who can fly, so they can feel very static and devoid of life. Again, it feels weird that you interact with Zonai researchers who have hot air balloons and flying Rito, but aren't really making a concerted effort to get to the sky. There isn't a greater mystery to solve up there. When Raru comments on him not remembering these locations being in the sky, it makes us curious too. But I guess the sages lifted it for when Link eventually showed up? I, I don't know. This point is a bit fuzzy to me, but again, if feels like a mystery leading to us discovering through gameplay or quest, and just kind of doesn't. The lack of NPCs in the sky can seem like a moot point, but for me it would have added to the world building in a good way. The sky didn't need to be riddled with NPCs, but small interactions here and there with new information we discover alongside other characters, that would have been pretty cool. Let's talk about island variety. 
not including the temples or the Great Sky Island, we have a handful of island types. The Dive Challenges, Death Stars, the One Zonite Factory, Lomai Labyrinth Mirrors, Lore Stars with information that overlaps with Tear Flashbacks, Flux Constructs or King Gliok Battle Platforms, and Gotcha Hubs. There are smaller islands here or there, but they seem more like connector type islands, like a point for launching off to different islands. Now on the surface, that seems like a fine amount, but really, you can explore a lot of the sky very quickly. And once you have been to one of these types of locations, you feel like you have kind of seen them all and can feel very samey, which I know it isn't, but it just feels like it is. Let's take the dive challenges, for instance. These were a lot of fun, a good way to use the new diving mechanic to weave it into a mini game that also yields new armor that helps you free falling and traveling. But the problem is, once you've done each of them twice, there really isn't a reason to return. I'm sure you could go back and do the challenge again and again, just for the fun of it, but wouldn't it be more fun if the challenge changed? Instead of going down, you're now going in reverse, or now you have to climb using the ascend ability to climb as quickly as possible. I did do this on my own just for the fun, not using any Zonite devices and just using a Send, and it honestly was a blast. Or how about if the islands reoriented themselves horizontally for a paraglider game? I saw potential for reusing the same locations in a different way. And it seems like the developers did as well because they did something very similar after collecting all the Zelda tiers. If you head back to the Great Sky Island, you are drawn to the top by some glow and a construct will unlock the most extreme game of the floor's lava you can play and it was a lot of fun. I just wish we could have seen more of this. You see the seeds of more expanded ideas there, but they're largely one and done. Something else I feel leads to a lack of sky variety is the sky real estate. We have massive space above Hyrule and yeah, there are lots of islands on varying levels of verticality, but I just feel like they didn't fill the sky enough. Look at the space above Gerudo Desert, completely barren save for one platform for a King Gliok. I know why this was done, because of the sandstorm, that was the challenge for unlocking the spirit temple, but it feels like the whole challenge might have been more appropriate in the depths. Your vision down there is already obscured, and they could have hung the temple from the ceiling instead of compromising the limited space they had in the sky for the sake of a sandstorm. Also, look at the entire perimeter of Hyrule. Above the huge chasm that hugs the north and western areas, there's nothing above them. Same goes for above the ocean. These vast areas that are largely devoid of any activity in the sky. It isn't that just more equal better. but. If they were not so limited with the areas they had to work with, I feel we could have got a lot more out of the sky area and maybe would have felt like a more complete experience. By the time I had done all there is to do in the sky, it left me feeling like is that it? the first labyrinth I went to was so mysterious and alluring. Going all the way to my first low gravity area, solving the puzzle, and then diving all the way down to the depths so freaking awesome but then down there i fight a construct i have already fought before to get a piece of armor i had in the last game this is what i mean by disappointing we are given some new scenarios but with old rewards and when i could surmise that all the other labyrinths were going to be like this i was really bummed out a quick side note too why when i select the labyrinth side quest does it show me on the map the exact locations of each point I need to reach. Isn't that the point of a maze? God forbid you had to think, or at the very least go online and look up the quest. It's just disappointing. The most focused on aspect of the new game, and this was the extent of it. <laughs> like I said, the surface of Hyrule remains largely unchanged. We have one new town, Lookout Landing, and this place is pretty cool. I mean, Purr is there, so it's where I like to spend the majority of my time for uh, <laughs> research purposes. But this town is awesome, really. We get introduced to our new cartography method, 
and the newest feature of the land of Hyrule, an underground cave system. By the way, this entire underground area leading into the castle is the best cave system you are going to find in the game. It goes on and on. It leads to good gear and feels so fun exploring it. Throughout Hyrule, you will find tons of caves. These are fun to explore at first. A lot of the time they feel like, okay, I've seen this already, and then I'd pin the cave and come back to it. Some underground areas are better than others, and I think they do add something good to the surface, but again, it's just not enough. I kind of had a thought of a good idea would be like in War to Warcraft Cataclysm, where the upheaval changed the landscape in major ways. But yeah, the caves were fine, kind of samey after a while, but the world just as a whole doesn't have enough newness to keep me engaged while traversing Hyrule. All in all, the caves are fine. Not great, it just kind of fine. Um. The depths encapsulate what I was saying about the Tears Syndrome. The first time I descended into the depths, my mind was actually blown. What the hell? This is... I... I am... I am a dumb baby. In a big world. I could not believe that Nintendo kept this whole edition under wraps. It felt so alien and mysterious. Dangerous to even be down there in the depths. Completely dark. The floor took your hearts away and then it wouldn't return unless you had food or sunlight. The enemies are even covered in gloom. I first ascended through a chasm on the Great Plateau that led me through some minecart tracks to a massive, massive structure housing a gigantic Poe Collector statue, and from there getting auto-build and facing Koga and discovering a Zonite foundry. All these cool discoveries and interesting ways to get around the depths, and that was kind of the only time this happened. Finding a bunch of interesting sites one after the other, it felt like Nintendo thought big equal good, but honestly, I would have liked less empty space for a trade-off of having more linear traversal. There just isn't much to actually see in the depths for me. I didn't even collect all the light route, mostly because I found it boring seeking them out, and you didn't get a reward for collecting them all that really did anything. I only uncovered this much of the depths before I had enough and was wanting to not go down there anymore. I have no love for callbacks to past games in the form of a reward in the current game, like you collect these old maps all over that will lead you to specific area in the depths and you just find old gear from other games. You get one new set of armor from the depths and I love the idea of this light up mining gear and it looks pretty cool. But finding an old map in the sky, marking an undiscovered location, then you go all the way down there to find a hat I had in an older game and have no intention of wearing felt like a cruel joke. I want new things. I get fan service is a thing that exists, but damn, just charge 10 bucks for all these outfits and call it a day or tie it to an amiibo or something. Hey guys, uh, while I was editing this, I actually found out that you can just get the gear from amiibos, so I went from being annoyed to actively mad about this. For me, it just doesn't feel good to have this great organic motivation to go somewhere and then to get something paramount to Leo pointing at something meme. The depths have massive amounts of verticality and there's nothing done with it. I mean, there's enough verticality to put floating islands in the sky of the depths. I kept imagining a temple or something hanging from the ceiling, kind of like stalagmites, but with cool stuff in them. Maybe a unique mini boss in gear up there? How about some floating platforms? I mean anything, but it's completely empty. Just a bunch of nothing. The Colosseums are pretty cool, don't really have a problem with those. Fun, challenging sometimes. It feels like the depths as a whole is a singular puzzle, and once you solve it, the challenge is over. The area as a whole is a cool idea, but man, it just feels like it's really rushed. Even the biomes are largely the same. You either get little trees or big mushroom trees. Also, the fact that the enemies you fight on the surface 
are down in the depths too? That feels wrong. You get those little fronks and the big fronks, but that's it for new enemy types. There should have been wholly unique enemies to the depths that really give it a whole new dimension. It almost feels like being down there, you should have some kind of weather-like condition to combat, like the hot or cold areas, but you don't really. All in all, the new areas failed to live up to the complete new world that was established in Breath of the Wild and left me feeling, yet again, disappointed. The gameplay in Tears of the Kingdom is definitely the highlight of the entire experience. You have almost limitless options when it comes to how you engage in combat, exploration, and puzzle solving. From making a steak sword to hover bikes or any ludicrous amount of mind power you have to solve a shrine. But I feel a lot of people will get varying degrees of enjoyment from this, and it feels like you're only limited by your own imagination. It can feel like you don't know how the rules of the world works with certain items or interactions, so it can lead to discoveries feeling accidental, and can make you feel kind of dumb for not figuring out an item's full potential. But when it comes to the gameplay, the biggest problems I had were the button mapping, menuing, enemy variety, and a lot of the shrines. The button mapping is a big issue for me. You have attack on the Y button instead of a trigger. This means you can't attack and pan the camera around or run and move the camera around without having to do like a claw. Just wish we could remap the buttons ourselves. It was a problem I had in Breath of the Wild and it's still an issue. Having the options would not hurt the game in any more game breaking ways that people can do already. But having the accessibility would be great. I always feel like I was playing DDR in the controls and never really felt in control. The button mapping didn't feel as intuitive or natural as I would like and I wish I could change it to my personal wants and needs. When A.G. Numa stated that he completed Tears of the Kingdom, and I quote, about 20 times, I have to stop and ask, did he not have a singular thing to say about the menuing in this game? Now they have this great circle menu for selecting things like rewind, ascend, ultra hand, auto build, the map for some reason, even though there's a dedicated map button, the camera, and amiibo. Did he not think, hmm, you know, this circle menu would work great for everything else? How do you fix a problem so seamlessly, and then leave in the endless doom scrolling. Honestly, how did it happen? How did that happen? Even with a bunch of weapons, bows, and shields, you could have overlapping circles, or just make the circle bigger. But being able to open your inventory and at a glance pick what you want would have been really amazing. My god, the arrow fusing. This was probably the worst in terms of menuing. Since you can fuse anything to your arrows, they had to make everything available. And it feels like I'm being punished for picking up things in the game. Yeah, you can sort by type, power and most use, but you can't set favorites like you can with auto build. So if I want to experiment, I really have to go out of my way to try and you shall atone for your foolish <laughs> ambitions. I guess the sage abilities can tie into menuing. Why not? Yeah, I'm going to say something very bold and controversial. I don't like the way you use the sage's powers. Sure, having an avatar to help with some of the younger or more casual fans in combat is awesome, but why do we, in order to activate their powers, do we have to, number one, find them amidst combat, number two, run up to them as they move away from you, three, hit A to prime them, and number four, then activate their power. In Breath of the Wild, it was just easier to meet a condition and the power would work. It worked just fine, but no, now it's more fun to use it this way. Do you know how many times I had Tullin summoned and would go to pick something up and he blew him the hell away from me? Too many freaking times. There are countless options they could have done to improve how you activate their powers. However, the problem for me is that they have it the way it is. I don't understand how in Breath of the Wild they work so much better, but now you have to work extra hard to use the powers you earned. Another thing that really bothers me is why can't I select equip set with the armor? 
you have to select every piece individually. Most set bonuses don't get the full effect unless you're wearing the whole set. So it would have been really nice to just be able to hit a button in the menu to equip the entire set. We really needed a bunch of new enemies in Tears of the Kingdom. The new enemies we have are Constructs, Flux Constructs, Fronks, Big Fronks, Gleox, Aerodactyls, Big Bokoblin Leaders, Gibdo, Like Like, Horriblins, and the Gloom Hands. That's it. This seems like a lot, but some of those don't even pose the slightest threat to you. But why is enemy variety important? It adds to the game in a ton of ways. Do y'all remember the Iron Knuckles from Ocarina of Time? These things were awesome. Up until that point in the game, we hadn't fought anything like this. It would react to our attacks, pressure you, tank hits, destroy the environment, and it would whoop your ass if you weren't paying attention. I don't need Zelda to be Dark Souls. I already have Dark Souls, but having enemies that behave differently, and plenty of them, keeps you engaged. If temples had their own unique enemies to add to their identity, then I would have been more engaged with combat. But I already know how to beat all the enemies around the world, so it feels like the threat is stripped away. Breath of the Wild didn't have a massive enemy variety either, but just having two variations of the Guardians, they were always threatening, even up until the end of the game. Again, I don't need Zelda to be Dark Souls, but when you take away any semblance of a threat or anything like that, it makes the game just feel lifeless. This is a really tough one for me. See, early in the game, the puzzles felt amazing, like vast improvements over Breath of the Wild. I felt like I could do so many different things to solve a shrine, and hearing how other people solve the same shrine, it was like, we had vastly different thought processes and experiences. And that is one of the best things about this game is that there is no right way. But this is where it gets a little complicated. It got to the point where I could look at a puzzle and think, okay, what do they want me to do with this versus what do I want to see if I can do? And it led to a lot of confusion. See, when you learn a handful of ways to solve something, you could kind of use them regardless of the situation. It leads to them feeling like the same puzzle, like it's solved before you even see it. There were a few that seemed so obscure, and I would just use Ultra Hand in a combination with another power and make cake of it. Or God forbid you had a Zonai device attached to a shield, then you could just completely skip most of, if not all, of the shrine. But a few of the shrines were so large in scope, you could only do what they really intended, and you would get a really satisfying solution. Tears of the Kingdom has 152 shrines. That's 32 more than in Breath of the Wild, but there seems to be way more shrines that the puzzle is, find the shrine and you walk in and you get a little prize. I don't really like this. Why does it have to be one or the other? Why not both? It can feel like it's lazy, and I know Nintendo worked extremely hard on this game, but when you do all 152 shrines and you keep getting little prizes instead of satisfying puzzles that tease your brain, it can feel lazy after so many of them. Finding a shrine as a puzzle is fine, but then, Let's continue down this problem solving path. I'm not the first to think of this, but a puzzle maker like a Mario maker, but for Tears of the Kingdom would be so cool. I would love to see what fans come up with, and this could add an insane amount of longevity to the game outside of the most hardcore player base. But seriously, this was the only part of the game I 100%ed because I didn't want to miss out on any fun puzzles. But when I got to 152, I was so glad it was over. But on the flip side, the newest shrine additions were proving grounds. The first one of these I encountered in the game was the one with the little battle bots. Now, up until that point of the game, I had not seen these little devices, so trying to learn what the hell they did amidst being attacked felt pretty terrible, but I got through it and it was fine. It was just not the greatest learning experience for me, but as the game went on with these proving grounds, 
They turned out to be such a great addition. Having so many of your overpowered options taken away from you and forcing you to be resourceful with what you had on hand, it's so good. I kind of wish they took this a step further and took away your max hearts too, but I'll take what I could get at this point. I think that's why I look back at Breath of the Wild Shrines a tad bit more favorably now. It felt like you were being resourceful more often than not. I still enjoy trying to solve things my own way, but in Tears of the Kingdom, it felt like I was cheating by using what they gave me. Also, why all these crystal ones? I get at first they are challenging, but just like exploring the depths, once you find one solution for these, you have effectively solved all the crystal shrines before even finding them. The story and the way it was told was probably my least favorite part of the game, and it's exactly how Breath of the Wild told its story, through flashbacks or flash tears, tear backs, and helping each race in the region to solve a problem directly affecting them one by one. Now. In Breath of the Wild, it made a lot more sense for the story to be told in this way. Link had been asleep healing for a hundred years and had no memory. Things were explained to him and us simultaneously as to what was happening and what had happened. A true fish out of water. The current state of the world and how it worked felt right being explained to us. The disjointed fashion in which we received memories wasn't perfect, but it made logical sense in this context. The lack of urgency to get to Hyrule Castle and defeat Calamity Ganon also felt appropriate since Zelda had basically forced a stalemate for the past 100 years and the Master Sword was separated from Link, so a few hundred hours of game time to allow us to gallivant around Hyrule made sense. This lack of urgency enabled us to explore at whatever pace you wanted to set for yourself, and if you wanted to explore this new world completely, you were going to need time. And it was a world worth exploring. Personally, I did not love the story in Breath of the Wild. I felt like the events that set up the game were so detached from us actively interacting with the world that everything feels secondhand. The interesting events happened already and we missed them. However, through the memories we see such a strong buildup of Zelda's trials and get to see her grow as a character. We get all these great vignettes of Zelda with Link and the champions interacting with each other, bonding, learning, struggling, and ultimately failing. These instances of Link and Zelda's relationship growing made me want to see so much more of them interacting. Zelda's character growth was by far the best part of Breath of the Wild's story for me. We see a young person having the weight of responsibility being thrust upon her when she feels her abilities are not being utilized in the best way to help. Being shown her frustrations and clearly understanding how she feels and empathizing with her struggles. We see her arc on full display. All of this makes her a much stronger character than she has been in any other game where she can seem too aloof or incognito to really get a feeling for who she is outside of being a princess. It was a very simple story, but that's what most of Zelda's stories are, simple. And by the end of the game, although I didn't love the story, I couldn't help but feel like it was a satisfying experience after taking it all in. Traveling around and helping each new champion realize their potential and subduing the divine beast was great. Link doing what he does best, being a beacon for courage to enable those around him to be courageous themselves. However, we didn't really get a real antagonist in Breath of the Wild. Calamity Ganon was more of a force that we had to contend with, kind of like if you were going to go try to fist fight a hurricane. He didn't really have any goals or plans. It was just, this thing is evil and doing bad things and we need to stop it. And while I didn't love it, it was serviceable in this case. So let me talk about Tears of the Kingdom's main story and why it didn't exactly work for me. Once again, Zelda is largely taken out of the story proper. I'm actually seeking this game more than the last one. Yeah, uh-huh, uh yeah, uh-huh. But she is missing all the agency and characteristics we have seen her have. And yes, technically, she is present for the entirety of the game in dragon form, but if your character takes actions that results in them quote-unquote losing themselves 
and becoming a wandering mindless eternal being are they really the same character yeah i don't think so my big problem with the whole time travel plot is that when zelda is in the past she doesn't detail to raru or sonya exactly what happened to make her end up in the past they don't even ask zelda how she obtained her secret stone. You would think it would be a big deal since Raru had the sage's secret stones locked away. All she does is lament that she is in the past and can't figure out how to return. Also, she won't stop gushing about Link or how she evicted him. Now comes the conjecture. Well, maybe she didn't know that the Ganon in this time was the being she encountered under the castle. It, I don't know, what does that matter? Regardless if Zelda knows who or what is under Hyrule Castle in the present, she could have told Raru and Sonya immediately and they could have pieced it together. I mean, there's a picture of Ganondorf on the mural and they can't say, hmm, that looks like someone we know. These characters can detect if someone is from their same bloodline hundreds of thousands of years apart, but Zelda can't communicate these events to them. I mean, she took pictures of the Imprisoning War murals on her iPad that was with her in the past, but she couldn't show them the photos? All the statues of Zonai who look a lot like Raru, and she doesn't mention this. Zelda makes it abundantly clear to Link that she had studied the events that led up to the founding of Hyrule, and she meets a Zonai and doesn't even ask him about any of this? Why not? It makes Zelda, who in Breath of the Wild is all about learning and research, can't use her greatest asset, which is her mind. It makes her seem so stupid, and I don't like that. Zelda is a lot of things, but stupid is not one of them. She cares about knowledge and actively seeks it out, and loves to share what she learns for the sake of her people. But for the all important time travel plot, she can't speak on the matter until it is way way too late. For me, this led the events of the past feeling mostly like Zelda's fault. I know Ganon mansplains to Raru that it was hubris on the Zonai King's part that led to the death of his wife and Ganon obtaining a secret stone, but it makes it feel like Zelda's fault more than anything. They bait the Zelda puppet out to confront it but had no plan other than let's confront this puppet. It's no surprise that Ganon capitalized on this opportunity. I don't want to cite other games that did a twist better, but I'm gonna. In Ocarina of Time, Ganondorf sets up all the events that led to Link drawing the Master Sword, thus opening the way to the Sacred Realm so Ganondorf can take the Triforce. For us, the player, it feels like this is a triumphant moment, but then Ganondorf appears twirling his non-existent mustache, revealing that this is what he wanted. That kind of manipulation is missing here. It's just one character not communicating to the all-powerful other character that they should probably do something about the obvious threat in the room. In this format, it sounds like I'm nitpicking, but this is what was going through my mind every time we got a story beat or cutscene. I am left asking why these characters are doing these things. The events of the present time seem to be fine. The upheaval created a crisis in each race's region. We can see the negative effects of this and work proactively with characters we know to solve them. I don't know, these events are fine, but after seeing how Link and Zelda interacted in Breath of the Wild and seeing the first trailer we got for Tears of the Kingdom with the two of them together again just made it feel like we would have the moments they shared but now in the present. Separating them felt so wrong. You can say that she sacrificed herself to save the kingdom, thus it justifies all her inaction, but she is right back to where she started and didn't really grow much at all. She met her distant ancestors and put one of them in such a dangerous situation it led to her getting murdered and the other to sacrifice himself. Way to go, Zelda! Another thing, since Raru had Ganon in prison, what was keeping anyone from taking his stone back? It was just chilling there. The sages go their respective ways so quickly and Zelda has to track them down in order to have them ready to help Link when he shows up with their descendants. Did they really need convincing of this? It just feels so empty. I thought what the champions went through was a lot more compelling. Also, the power balance with the stones confuses me. So let me get this straight. Without a stone, Raru is just much more powerful than Ganon. 
but Ganon with a stone can single-handedly defeat Raru who has a stone, his sister another Zonai and also has a stone, Princess Zelda with a stone, and four other sages with stones? Okay, then what are the point of the stones? And I know this is petty, but I hate the term secret stone. Everybody knows about them, so how are they so secret? The biggest problem I had with the game's story was mixed in with the gameplay. I was in the sky collecting images of accounts in the past for a side quest in Kakariko Village and I noticed the light dragon coming close and I was curious to see if I could jump on the dragon. I tried this a lot in Breath of the Wild to no success, but lo and behold, I can stand on the dragon. Oh, what's that up on the forehead? I found the Master Sword by complete accident. I drew the sword and got the cutscene of Zelda calling out to Link, cradling the Master Sword, saying we'll have Zelda's strength through the Master Sword to defeat the Demon King. Yeah, sure would be a shame if Zelda was there as the character we know to help with any of this. God, it just grinds my gears so much. I got this cutscene and figured out that Zelda is a dragon, so by the time I got three similar cutscenes of Zelda Dragon talk with Minoru and then seeing her transform, it didn't feel very rewarding. This is partly due to my own curiosity, but the game teaches you to be curious. Go anywhere at any time. It is funny, Breath of the Wild broke away from so many conventions of 3D Zelda games that made the series feel samey and stifled to now be chained to these new conventions they built for themselves and it hurt the experience for me. I could go into more details about story specific things, but I feel like I've summed up the main issues of the story. It's mostly just yeeting Zelda out of the story as quickly as possible and making her behave in a way inconsistent with what we've seen prior and what made made her my favorite representation of Zelda in the series done so far. And that's what it really comes down to. They had been working on this game for so long and they really didn't need to do too much to make it just another great experience. But to have so much just be the same and feel like deja vu, it makes you really wonder, is this the extent of their storytelling? Are we going to get another Zelda story told exactly the same way again? What Nintendo did with Breath of the Wild was revolutionary. Nintendo's first attempt at an open world game redefined what it meant to be an open world game and set a new standard that now every open world game is held to. Stories in the way that they're told is so important. Technology changes standards change, hardware is upgraded, controls become obsolete, but stories are the things that stay timeless. Alright, if you made it to the end of this video, thank you very much. I know it sounded like I was complaining a lot, which I was, but really this took me a very long time to put all this together. I finished the game about a month ago now and I just had to sit with this for so long, really thinking about what felt so disappointing to me about this. But if you made it this far, I would really appreciate either a like, a dislike, a comment, a sub share the video, whatever you want to do. I really want to keep making videos like this, and I feel like this is the first step in a new direction for me when it comes to making videos. So really, if you made it this far, I appreciate it so much. Thank you. Have a nice day.